Hey, you guys, this is Mark Silver. I am an author, photographer, and educator here in Carmel, California. And I'm here to continue my discussion of the second part of the cycle of photography that we're decoding, and that's about equipment. Here we go. All right, so you know what aperture is, I hope. If you don't, it's just the size of the opening. Aperture basically means opening. And the, it's a funny thing because these are fractions. And that's why F stands for focal. And that's basically the opening. It's, it's a fraction. So some people get confused because if it's a bigger number, shouldn't it be a bigger opening? Well, think about it. It's a fraction. Okay. So these openings are very, very important to you because... They not only control how much light gets let in. So the smaller the opening, the darker it is. The larger the opening, the brighter it is. But it also gives you your depth of field. It should have been called depth of focus. What, why, why bring in field into this? What, what the heck is a field? You know, focus is, is really what you're talking about. Let's call it depth of focus. When you've got a small opening, you get a very deep focus. A lot of stuff is in focus. When you have a very wide opening, it has a very shallow focus and each has its own purpose, which I'm gonna show you. You gotta know these things instinctively. Be able to look at a scene and go, this is how I visualized it. That's how I'm gonna control my aperture. Here's a good example. This is a deer calf in Yosemite National Park that I photographed. I didn't want Half Dome in the background here to intrude upon the beautiful deer looking right at me. So I wanted that to be out of focus. So I think I used an aperture of about four, five, six, something like that, because I absolutely wanted her, the deer, to be in focus. Look at those eyes, very sharp. And I wanted Half Dome to recede in the background. That's controlling my depth of field. Very important because it's how I wanted to tell the story. Taken from almost the same spot, I wanted the foreground and the background to both be in focus. I wanted the trees to be in focus and I wanted Half Dome to be in focus. So I shot this at probably F16 or 32 or 22. Uh, again, I'm controlling what I want the viewer to see. And it's all about your vision, and your communication. That's what you're controlling with your aperture. Now, shutter has another purpose. Let's get me out of the way here. Shutter is basically controlling the speed. And if you want to stop the action, you use a very fast shutter speed. If you want it to blur, you use a slow one. It's that simple. There's purposes for each one. So let's look at some examples here. This is a photograph of a carousel in the Tuileries in Paris. Tuileries is a beautiful park. There's this carousel and I visualize it and I thought, I wanna show the motion, but I don't want everything in motion. I wanna have some stillness and get the motion of the figures in the carousel. So I shot this, I believe at 1 25th of a second. 1 25th. I did not have a tripod with me. So I had to steady it on one of the, throughout Paris and me, other major cities, there's these poles, they call them stanchions. These poles sit up there and they serve great purpose for us as photographers. You can put your camera on top and steady it. That's if you don't have a tripod. So I wanted that motion. That was how I wanted to visualize it. I think that the photograph would be far less interesting if I shot it at a 500th of a second and everything stopped. Do you agree? It's how I told the story. Now here's another example. Shooting these polo players, I wanted everything still. I didn't want the, all the horses. Now I could have visualized it that way, but I wanted stillness. And so I shot this, I think at 320th uh, of a second. I, Three one three twentieth of a second, rather, because I wanted this, the action to stop. I wanted to get this geometry. That was another part of my visualization with their mallets. 
and I wanted them close together. So I had this pre-visualized. I only took two frames, I think. Kind of interesting. And I had to be way far away because you don't want to be on the polo field with these polo ponies chasing. They run you over. I almost got run over anyway. So that's you using your shutter speed. And the thing is you're controlling these with your exposure triangle and you wanna just have this again as an instinctive thing. So this is a really important triangle. We've already talked about depth of field. The smaller the opening, the more in focus you have, depth of focus. That's your aperture. Also how much light it lets in. And then shutter speed, You've got speed and sharpness. You want very, very sharp. You can go all the way to one eight thousandths. I've never done that. You want something in motion. You might, you might have a 10 minute exposure. You're doing astrophotography. You might have a very long exposure. And that doesn't necessarily, in that case, because nothing is moving that fast, doesn't necessarily change your sharpness because you're putting it on a tripod. But there is a factor there you have to be aware of. One thing you don't want is your camera shake to interfere with what you're trying to photograph. And so modern cameras have good stabilization. So you can go down to some pretty slow shutter speeds and still avoid camera shake. But you have to be aware of that. And in many cases, when you get to these slow shutter speeds, you want to use a tripod. Then we have ISOs, the other component. ISO, a, a low number of ISO, low number on your ISO, it's going to reduce the noise. High number, you're going to get in, you're going to get noise. Let me dispel something right now. Modern cameras do not reduce noise completely. Do not get fooled by that. Every photographer I know, a pro, every pro photographer I know goes by the rule of shooting at the lowest ISO possible. I had somebody criticize me, Mark, you know, modern cameras reduce all the noise. It's not true. Sorry, folks. I'm sorry. It's just not true. Go out and shoot and see how much noise is still there. Now, yes, you can handle it in your post-processing, but why not reduce it to a minimum to begin with? I shoot as close as I can to the lowest number that I can. And I adjust that ISO constantly. I don't leave it, you know, set it at... 25,000 and expect that that's going to work for everything. It's not, you know, so, so you have to adjust these things. And these are your three key points. And the only other one added to that is focus. Those are the things you have to know so well that they become totally instinctive. You guys with me on that? Okay. Now, another thing, when you're learning your camera, I got to tell you, don't read the manual. I used to say, read the manual. But the problem is those manuals are not really written to be clearly understood, is get one of these, the field guide for your camera. Now that's written in such a way that you can actually understand it, <laughs> okay? It's much clearer and, you know, this guy has done a really good job. You can get these on Amazon for pretty much every key camera. And I recommend that you have one of these. I don't read it cover to cover. It's not meant for that. But you you refer to it as you need those tools. Again, you don't need to know 500 settings. Yeah, I still have my manuals. I do keep my manuals, but I try to refer to the field guide. The other thing that's really helpful, you keep notes of the things you've discovered because I guarantee you, you're gonna come back to it later on and go, what was that setting again? Well, you should have it written down like I have in here. I've had this for a long time. And you can then refer back to it and go, oh yeah, that setting, let's say it's a video setting or an audio setting or whatever, something you don't use a lot. It's in your notebook, keep it. The other thing you can do is you can get my app here at zither.co. That's uh, the app that I built and you guys can go and get it and add your equipment to it and then put your notes in there. So every time you've got a setting, you can put it there. I kind of do both because sometimes I just want to be able to look at the notebook. So that's kind of a handy tool there. 
So there you go. I got a question for you. You guys know why it's called f-stop? What, what does the stop even mean? Why stop? Where did that even come from? I didn't know the answer to this until I was writing my book. And I looked it up. I had to do some research on that. And they were originally, so there's a lens. They were originally pieces of metal inserted into a lens one at a time with different size openings called stops. See this? This is actually a modern lens, believe it or not. You can buy it on B&H, but it's a replica of a much older lens. And these are what the stops look like. So you would put them in and out, and they call them stops. Boom. That's why it's called F-stop. Pretty cool, right? So those are the components. I'm going to just go back here. These are the things you need to know to decode your camera. And you need to know them so well that they become instinctive. And I'm going to invite you guys to do everything I've talked about in this video. Just follow along with me and let me know how it improves your photography. Okay. So thank you guys for joining me. Take what I've told you and do it. Don't forget, leave your comments, share this video to people that you know, like it, leave your comments. I want to see what you have to say. And last but not least, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Take care, you guys. Stay safe, stay well, and stay creative. Please subscribe and enable the bell so you don't miss any of our new shows. Like the video and please share it and leave your comments. I love hearing from you. And remember to get out and capture your own images of life.